Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to the SWOG Immunotherapeutics Committee meeting. My name is Katie Politi, and I'm a cancer biologist at Yale University, and I co-chair this Immunotherapeutics Committee together with Dr. Siwen Huliskoven, who is joining us uh, via Zoom. Siwen, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hello, everyone. I'm sorry I cannot be there right now. I wish I could be there. Um, I'm a medical oncologist and a translational researcher from Huntsman Cancer Institute. It's very nice to meet with you all. Thank you, Siwen. So uh, today we have several exciting talks uh, and presentations. Um, that you'll that you'll hear about uh, throughout uh, throughout the afternoon. We wanted to welcome you here and also remind you that if you are interested in joining our monthly immunotherapeutics committee meetings that we hold um, on the first Friday of every month at 3:30 p.m. Eastern time, you can email us and we can add you to the list. We have recently been having uh, representatives from the different disease committees join these meetings and tell us about the IO trials that they have and about the translational uh, science in these IO trials and talking about some of the challenges and big questions that they're facing. We also uh, are happy to include discussions of different clinical trials and different concepts in these meetings. So if you have a concept or you have something that you'd like to bring to the committee for discussion, you can let us know and then we will schedule uh, a discussion of that concept at one of these uh, IO committee meetings. And so that's a, a, an opportunity to receive feedback from the group. See when, is there anything uh, that you'd like to add before we move on to the, um, the presentations? Thank you, Katie. I think you have covered all. All right, thank you. So we'll go right ahead and uh, introduce the first speaker. So actually the first two speakers we have today are from the Jackson Labs. And um, we, we thought that we'd have them speak together because they're gonna tell us about genetic contributions to immune related adverse events and also to response to immune checkpoint blockade. And so we thought that having these two presentations together was, um, uh, they went well together because there was gonna be this uh, discussion and they would talk about the genetic contributions to this. So these different aspects uh, that are important for uh, immunotherapies um, uh, used uh, in the clinic. And so it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker today. Our first speaker is Dr. David Cerez, who's a professor at the Jackson Laboratory. Dr. Cerez's research is on the genetics of immunological tolerance to endogenous proteins and studies of autoimmune diseases, in particular type one diabetes. Today, he's going to talk to us about the identification of genes that contribute to immune checkpoint blockade induced immune related adverse events. So thank you very much, Dr. Cerez, for joining us here today and presenting your work. Yeah. First of all, I want to thank everybody for the kind uh, in invitation. Uh, as Katie just said, as I've made my career as an investigator using mouse models to understand the genetics for autoimmune type one diabetes, and if you, uh, if everybody, anybody had ever told me this would result in me speaking at a cancer meeting, I would have said you were insane, but um, here I am. So <clears throat> as everybody in this room, I'm sure knows, uh, in recent years, uh, a re revolution in the treatment of uh, various cancers has been cancer uh, immunotherapy has been elicited uh, by checkpoint blockade inhibitors. These are antibodies that block either CTLA-4 or, or PD-1 or either alone or in combination. And these molecules play normally play in a very important role uh, in uh, limiting uh, Im immune responses or to dampen an immune response uh, after it's cleared a virus or what, or what have you. 
And it's one of those few cases where I hated to say, I told you so, but I told you so. Uh, I was talking to people who were first getting into this, you know, a few years back. And I said, I bet you that at least some subset of patients that are, are going these um, immune checkpoint um, inhibitor treatments are going to develop um, autoimmune pathologies. And this is one of the few times I hated being right. Uh, so I'm just showing here in the first slide, uh, the first upper panel are some autoimmune disease states uh, that commonly result um, after anti-CTLA-4 treatment, uh, colitis, uh, epiphysitis. But then um, the most uh, checkpoint blockade uh, work these days is being done with anti-PD-1. And unfortunately, a very common uh, immune-related adverse event um, is, the, is the development of type 1 diabetes. Uh, and I'm going to also talk about today uh, another uh, less common autoimmune complication with PD-1 blockade, but unfortunately very often fatal to the patient is the development of uh, autoimmune myocarditis. And we've developed mouse models uh, to let you uh, understand the genetic basis for this. And so what I had was the idea that there, we've been ma mapping and identifying for years genes that are contributing to spontaneous autoimmune type 1 diabetes or spontaneous myocarditis. But I, we, I had an idea that perhaps there might be some genes that uniquely contribute to checkpoint blockade-induced autoimmune pathologies. And I hope to convince you this afternoon that that is indeed the case. All right. Next slide. I was assured that this was, okay, there we go. So particular major histocompatibility complexes, MHC, which is designated uh, HLA in humans for human leukocyte antigen, uh, particular variants of these are the primary drivers of both uh, beneficial and detrimental um, autoimmune responses. And I should actually point out that the MHC was, was discovered at the Jackson Laboratory by one of my mentors, a man named Dr. George Snell, uh, for which he won a Nobel Prize. Um, and so we've been using CRISPR approaches to delete in autoimmune diabetes prone NOD mice, disease associated murine MHC class one and class two molecules. And such um, murine MHC bear NOD mice uh, provide a platform for the pipeline introduction of any chosen combination of human disease associated HLA class one and class two variants. And by definition, T cell responses in such what we're calling HLA humanized NOD mice are patient relevant. So here are the combination of various human MHC genes, HLA genes that we can currently have uh, available to introduce into these murine MHC uh, deficient NOD mice, uh, class one variants, which mediate CD8 T cell responses, which I think are probably the final mediators of um, autoimmune type one diabetes development anyway. Uh, these include the A2 variant, uh, it's present in about 40% of Caucasians. It's enriched to about 60% in type 1 patients. And just as an interesting aside, the A2 variant was originally derived from Neanderthals. Uh, and then we also have available to us the A24 variant, the B39 the B39 variant um, is a gene that's associated with very early type 1 diabetes onset. These are usually kids less than five, five years uh, of, of age. And it was the class 2 variants that were first identified as being associated with autoimmune um, diabetes susceptibility, in particular to the DQ8 and the DR4. And we have the ability to introduce both of those into our uh, murine MHC deficient mice. And the, uh, introducing the DQ8 variant turned out to be very fortuitous because that's the one that allowed us to investigate uh, myocarditis. So just an aside of what we've been able to do. So first of all, we made MHC class one deficient NOD mice. And then we use those to introduce into them either the A2 or the B39 variant. To the left-hand side, I'm going to call, first of all, your attention to the solid lines in these um, immune histographs. And these are standard NOD mice showing that they're uh, expressing the murine H2D uh, class 1 variant as well as the H2K class 1 variant. But you see that they're not staining uh, with the dotted line. So that's an, an antibody that recognizes the human uh, class 1 variants. And in the very uh, far uh, right-hand panel, there. You can, that, these are our mice where we've knocked out the mouse cl class one and replaced it with humans. And that just shows that there's a shift of the dotted line that these mice uh, are expressing the human class one in the absence of mouse. 
And on the right-hand side, this is what the diabetes frequency is in the mice. Uh, you can see the squares there. These are the completely MHC deficient NOD mice. Uh, they don't develop any diabetes. That was not a surprise. But now when we introduce either the human A2 or the B39 variant, uh, they develop very aggressive diabetes. And by definition, this, this is a, a diabetes that's mediated by the human HLA class one molecules. So it's patient relevant. That's just a setup to show you how, now, how we then were able to translate the use of these mice to identify genes that are contributing uh, to checkpoint blockade induced disease. So for people who aren't used to uh, doing mouse ge uh, ge genetics, this is the general strategy that's used. So we have our A2 mice, because uh, we said that's the one, that, so the A2 is most commonly associated with type one diabetes. That's the diabetes susceptible strain. Even though they're white mice for the purpose of this uh, illustration, I'm gonna have those marked in blue. And then we have a black six, C57 black six strain that's actually congenic for the NOD MHC. And what we, we chose to use that one because we wanted to load up the system with as many diabetes susceptible MHC genes as possible to, to turn the deck in our favor. And so what we did is we crossed the susceptible strain with a resistant strain, made the F1 hybrids. And I can tell you from 37 years of work and NOD mice crossed with any other strain, the F1 hybrids have been universally re totally resistant to spontaneous diabetes. And that's of course what we're gonna see here. But then what you can do is you take those F1 hybrids uh, and back cross them to the susceptible strain. And historically using an outcross of the black six strain, about 10% of the mice develop spontaneous diabetes. And, and then you could identify the genes that were present in the affected mice versus the unaffected mice. And that's how we have done the mapping studies for many years now. So here's just a strategy. If you're having one gene on the, on the far left side here, you've crossed the susceptible strain that, that's homozygous uh, for the susceptibility gene, which we're marking as S versus a strain that's homozygous for the uh, resistance gene. Uh, all of your F1 hybrids are gonna be um, uh, heterozygous, obviously for the gene involved, S over R. And then if you take the F1 hybrids and you back cross them to the susceptible strains, you can get four separate combinations, okay? But two out of the four are homozygous for the susceptibility variant. So that's 50%. So if you had 50% of your uh, backcross one pro progeny affected by any phenotype that you want to study, uh, that would indicate there's only a single uh, re recessive gene that's contributing to, to the, uh, the phenotype. If you have two genes, same sort of strategy, but then you have eight different combinations and about two out of eight will be homozygous for both of the susceptibility genes. And that's 25%. So that would, that would tell you that you're, uh, approximately two genes are contributing to the phenotype that you're looking at and so on. Three genes would be 12 and a half percent, four genes, 6.25, um, et cetera. And I will also want to stress, this is for recessive disease associated genes. So we did this with doing the cross. I showed you with the A A2 mice. And as we expected, the PBS group, that's our spontaneous diabetes, we had about 11% of those mice uh, develop spontaneous diabetes, which is exactly what, what we anticipated from previous work. But in the mice that we treated with anti-PD-1, you can see we got almost 37% of the mice going. So that tells us that there's no more than two genes that are recessively con uh, contributing to ICI-T1D. One possibility I should stress though, there may be two genes that are recessively contributing to the disease and there be, may, might be one additional dominant acting gene that pushes it from that 25% level to that 36.9. All right. Here we go, thank you. All right, the other thing that we observed in these back cross one mice, and we looked at the mice that developed spontaneous diabetes, the PBS group versus the ICI group, is at the age of onset, it was a much more aggressive disease in the mice that were on, on the checkpoint um, inhibitors. You can see that most of the mice that developed uh, diabetes following checkpoint inhibition were younger than 17 weeks of age, um, where you can see that most of the mice that developed spontaneous diabetes, the mean average was around 30 weeks of age. So that tells us there's two possibilities, that the, uh, the ICI treatment either accelerates a known type 1 diabetes disease process and or engages new pathways for type 1 diabetes development. And we believe it's the latter. So we did basically a mouse GWAS study and uh, it's still ongoing. I expect the numbers to improve, but we've got two uh, hits, uh, significant hits so far. 
on chromosomes four and 19. And what I'm gonna point out is um, we have never found a gene in this region of either chromosome four or chromosome 19 that contributes to spontaneous diabetes. So this is telling us we have now mapped genes that are uniquely contributing to ICI-induced autoimmune type one diabetes. All right. So let's turn the attention to myocarditis for a moment. So we made these NOD DQ8 mice where we uh, used the CRISPR to ablate uh, both murine MHC class one and class two. We introduced the uh, human DQ8 class two variant. O originally we did this because it's a class two variant associated with diabetes susceptibility. But we noticed that about 10% of the mice were spontaneously dying when it wasn't from diabetes. We looked at it and we said, okay, don't, this mice were developing myocarditis. And then we looked at the mice uh, that were not um, developing uh, a lethal form of the disease. But when we looked at it histologically, we found that 90% of these DQ8 mice uh, de develop autoimmune myocarditis. But if we put them on anti-PD-1 treatment, you can see that 90% of them turned within, within two weeks. So we're gonna use the same strategy to try to map genes that are contributing to ICI-induced uh, myocarditis. So very similar strategy. In this case, instead of using the A2 NOD mouse, we used the DQ8 variant. Uh, we crossed it once again with our B6H2G7 strain, the resistance strain, went to the F1 hybrids. In this case, we have no historical data. Uh, and then once again, we, we went to the back cross. And once again, up coming into this project, we had no historical data. But this is what we've observed. The myocarditis project is not as advanced as the diabetes project. We don't have as many Bacross 1 pro progeny for, for myocarditis as we've generated so far for, for, for diabetes. But we're starting to certainly see a, a trend that's happening here. Uh, we've got about 7% of the mice that are developing a spontaneous myocarditis and about 42% uh, of mice so far that are, are de developing a drug-induced myocarditis. And this indicates that there are probably, once again, no more than two uh, recessive genes that are likely contributing uh, to ICI-induced myocarditis. I know an obvious question is going to be, is it the same two genes that are contributing to uh, ICI-induced diabetes as ICI-induced myocarditis? And the answer is, I can't answer that yet, but it would be really cool if the answer was yes. <clears throat> and it was just that the differences in the NHCs that the mice expressed uh, determine whether the autoimmune pathology was targeted towards the pancreatic beta cells uh, or towards the heart. But uh, maybe if I'm ever invited back here, I'll, ha I'll have an answer to that question. Oh, come on. And so what we're doing is we're having myocarditis is, is actually being scored histologically by Suzanne Sattler, a colleague at Imperial College in London. And she has this uh, scoring system where anything greater than a three, and I'll show you that in a minute, is considered to be myocarditis positive. So we were able to uh, break these mice into mice uh, that uh, Suzanne had scored as either myocarditis positive or negative. And I'll call your attention to the two left-hand data points. First of all, CD45 positive leukocytes, CD45 marks all, all white blood cells. You can find a significantly more uh, of them in the hearts of the mice that have the myocarditis, probably not surprising. And of those, uh, they were largely uh, CD90 positive uh, T cells. And the other thing I should point out is since DQ8 mediates CD4 T cell responses, this is actually a CD4 T cell mediated disease while the diabetes is, is a, uh, a class one uh, CD8 T cell mediated disease. And we really didn't wanna use death as an endpoint to be monitoring these Bacross 1 mice. So we were looking for um, metabolic surrogate markers. And as I said, uh, in Suzanne's system, anything greater than a three is considered to be uh, myocarditis positive. And so we found that serum myosin light chain three or MYL3 and skeletal uh, troponin uh, STNL levels actually provide a surrogate marker for myocarditis development in Bacross 1 mice. 
So once again, I would propose that in patients, uh, if you have uh, patients on checkpoint blockade inhibitors, especially if they're individuals that are expressing DQ8, these might be good met metabolic markers for uh, to be to be monitoring it in those patients to hopefully identify them before they go into uh, overt myocarditis and maybe stop stop the, the, the treatment or take some other approach. But once again, we think that these are now good surrogate markers. So what's next? We want to perform RNA-seq analyses on pancreatic lymph nodes that are derived from the CD8 T cells from Bacross 1 progeny with ICI-induced versus spontaneous type 1 diabetes. And we want to determine if any such genes that are found to be differentially expressed map to the relevant regions of chromosomes 4 and 19. They're currently indicated to control ICI-induced uh, versus spontaneous uh, the diabetes. This can actually help us, we hope, to identify the actual genes that are in, involved. Uh, hopefully, we'll have that data within the next year or so. Uh, we want to test possible candidate genes that are identified by the above approaches by uh, CRISPR conversion of putative susceptibility variants uh, to uh, the resistance variant. And we also want to carry out similar approaches to test candidate genes expressed in CD4 T cells that contribute to ICI-induced uh, versus spontaneous myocarditis. And I'll end there. I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. That was great. So anybody who, if you have questions, please come up to the microphones and you can ask the questions. And anybody on Zoom who has questions, uh, you can place them in the chat and then I will read them out and ask them to um, Dr. Serez. I'm going to get started with right. um, some questions. So my, my first question is, when you're looking at what we know about, about what is in those regions of chromosomes four and 19, are there any genes that stand out to you or any that are components of pathways that seem like they could be particularly uh, relevant or might be the- Well, the, the, the problem is these peaks you know, they cover a fairly wide region of, ge of genome. So there's usually dozens, if not more genes in there. But there are immunological related genes within both regions. That's why we want to go down back and do the RNA seq to actually identify genes that are differentially expressed in either CD8 or CD4 T cells that are contributing to ICI induced diabetes or myocarditis because those are the cell types that are actually involved in, in mediating the disease. And then we can see if any of those differentially expressed genes map back to the re relevant region. So that's the strategy that, uh, that we're taking right now. Yeah, it's I mean, I mean, there's there's too many candidates rather than rather than too few at this point in time. No, it's it's very exciting and sort of a, another question that I think could link uh, to some of the things that people in the audience may be thinking about, which is um, what is what 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 do you think like how could one think about then look at these types of issues in patients. Right. So if we have, if you identify, you know, once you know what genes might be responsible, what do you think are some next steps to look in patients with immune related adverse events? Or well, how would you move something to a patient population? Well, first of all, as I say that uh, these two metabolic markers I just talked to you about, uh, the troponin and the MYL3, those are certainly markers that you could monitor in, in the patients, you know, so I identify those that are maybe, you know, at risk for, for developing my, myocarditis. Uh, and it turns I didn't have really enough time uh, today, but it turns out that one of the best markers identifying people that are at risk for developing spontaneous type 1 diabetes is the development of autoantibodies, in particular autoantibodies directed against insulin. And we have actually found that in this system, uh, the mice that are going to go and develop the ICI do so actually have an accelerated onset of autoantibodies. And there are routine clinical means for measuring these autoantibodies. So that could be another way that you could I I identify um, the patients that are, are, are at risk for developing ICI-induced disease. Great. Do you think we'll get, ever, we'll get to the point where we'll have 
be able to look at the genetics of a person's germline genetics. That's the goal. And yeah. then, and then um, maybe from the get go, be extra careful. Cool. About yeah. Their... Now, of course, you know, we're using this to treat patients with cancer, unfortunately. Well, and in the case of diabetes, um, you can treat them with insulin. So I'd say, okay, these pe patients have, um, have, have cancer. I'm not saying that you would take them off ICI therapy. Matter of fact, I, I would continue them, but you just want to know which patients you want to really monitor for the diabetes complications. So you can get the insulin treatment started at the most efficacious time as possible. As an aside, it also looks at the patients who develop these adverse events, and particularly type 1 diabetes, are the ones that respond best to ICI therapy as a cancer intervention. Yeah. So we have a couple. We we have a couple of um, questions in the chat. Okay. So um, let me see if I can uh, follow them. So we have one that is uh, from Dr. Kuderer. Fascinating. Thank you. There is a quality report in a nature paper that family history of autoimmunity increases risk for immune-related adverse events. Mm -hmm. Why did you not think that predisposition to autoimmunity plays a role? Well, it very well could, okay? Um, I'm not saying there may be, when we get all said and done with this, there may, we may identify genes that are contributing to both forms of autoimmune type 1 diabetes, both the spontaneous and the ICI-induced. But then there's so these other genes that are uniquely contributing to the ICI-induced disease, and that accelerates the process. Remember, I showed you the mice that develop the ICI disease do so at a much younger age uh, than, than, than the spontaneous diabetes. So there could very well be um, that there are genes that, that will turn out to be in common when, when all is all said and done. Thank you. So a question from Dr. Vaena, is serum troponin T or I the best for monitoring or skeletal troponin? What are the differences? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to admit ignorance on, the, yeah. on that. I was that not, I was it. not the metabolic person uh, who, who, who did those, those assays. And it's an MYL3. Uh, these are commercially available kits um, that, uh, uh, that we use. So good question. I have to admit that I can't answer it. Okay. And Dr. Espinoza, were there any new adverse events noted in mice that either developed type 1 diabetes spontaneously or after ICI exposure that were re-exposed to ICI? Oh, okay. Um, what we're doing is we're giving these mice two injections, two anti-PD-1 injections uh, a week on a Monday and a Friday uh, for three weeks, and then we stop. Okay, and then so it, it, you, in the case of myocarditis, it can happen while you're giving them the, 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 the six, the six uh, in, injections. In the case of diabetes, it seems like even though you stop the therapy, you've initiated some process that results from the accelerated, both the acceleration of disease and in the, in the increase in frequency weeks later. So it's almost like you've set some you know, train down the tracks. And you know, even though you've stopped the therapy, the train is still moving. Thank you. We have uh, one last question. This is from Dr. Huli Scoven. Immune checkpoint inhibitors usually do not cause any toxicity in immune competent mice, such as C57. Yeah. What do you think is the reason in this model that the mice do not do develop not only type 1 diabetes, but also myocarditis. Okay, it's not the same mice developing both type 1 and myocarditis. It's the, it's the mice that are expressing the A2 variant that developed the diabetes. It's the mice that express the DQ8 variant uh, that developed the myocarditis. The NOD, uh, these HLA humanized NOD mice are, of course, are immune competent. That's why I showed that uh, second slide or whatever it was showing that, yeah, the mice without any MHC, of course, those are immune deficient because I can't mount a CD8 T cell response and you see absolutely no diabetes, but you introduce the A2 or the D, or excuse me, the A2 or the B39, you see that they develop a very aggressive di 
di diabetes. So that, of course, is indicating that these mice are immune competent, whereas the mice that are completely MHC deficient are not. And the very fact that they're developing disease uh, in a fashion that's dependent upon either the human A2 or the B39 variant indicates that the T cell responses that are causing the ICI-induced disease are indeed re re relevant to, uh, to patients that are expressing either of, of these class one variants. And so why don't the common models get, like, get the diabetes? For example, like the C57. See, so, okay. Well, I think that what happens is you, you have to have some un underlying autoimmune susceptibility genes. Uh, and you don't normally, in the spontaneous diabetes, you don't normally get to see the genes that would cause the acceleration if you put them on, 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 ICI, on ICI, okay? Uh, and that's why, you know, you see the solar disease in, in the standard nods. So I think, yeah, there, there has to be some underlying autoimmune proclivity genes there. But then there are, you know, so once again, I wouldn't be surprised at the end, we find some genes that are commonly contributing to both spontaneous and drug-induced disease, but then there are some other genes that are piling on and causing the acceleration, uh, both in, in time of, of onset and, and in the frequency. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Serez, for that great presentation. We look forward to hearing a follow-up on um, these studies and um, hear more about uh, what you find. Thank okay, you. Great. That was great. Okay, thank you for your attention. So our, our next speaker is also from the Jackson Laboratories. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Ed Liu. He's a professor and the president emeritus of the Jackson Labs. Uh, he was president for almost a decade until uh, recently. Uh, before that, he held uh, roles at the Genome Institute of Singapore, at the National Cancer Institute, and at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Dr. Liu uh, studies uh, the geno functional genomics of cancer and in particular has uh, worked on breast cancer for many years. Today, he uh, is presenting a recorded lecture on dissecting the genetic control of response to immune checkpoint inhibitors in cancer. His colleague, Dr. John Graham, is going to be um, joining us for the questions um, uh, afterwards. So um, I guess without further ado, I think we can start the recording. Thank you. Hi, this is Ed Liu, and I want to thank the committee to, um, for inviting us to give a description of a very interesting series of experiments that um, my colleagues and I have done to understand the genetic control of response to immune checkpoint inhibitors in cancer using model systems. As you well know, ICIs, immune checkpoint inhibitors, are remarkably successful, but the response rate is variable, anywhere from 10 to 40 percent, depending on tumor type. And in addition, there are life-threatening toxicities that are major limiting factors. So a major question that we wanted to gra uh, grapple with was, what is the cause of variability of response? Of course, we looked at tumor mutational burden, PDL1 expression, but we also know that these are not perfect and that uh, our hypothesis going into this experiment was that host genetics, the genetics of the patient, fundamentally shapes the immune response to ICI. Uh, and that if we can crack the genetic code for this response, um, that we can stratify patients according to their genetic proclivity for response, and uh, by identifying the genes that modify response, we can identify targets to enhance therapeutic response. Now, as you well know, this hypothesis is rather difficult to test in, in the clinic because of tumor genetic complexity, um, the variation of, of therapies and, and tumor types, and also that um, you add on top of that the fact that we're all different on a genetic basis. And the physicists would call this a near impossible three-body problem to solve. However, at the Jackson Labs, we were put our heads together and asked the very specific question, can we construct a system whereby host genetics can vary while we keep the tumor genetics, the environment and the treatments constant? And to do so, um, we, used a, a genetic trick that we have used before. 
And that is the generation of this collaborative cross series of in, uh, recombinant inbred lines. This is a very important reagent because it starts out um, about, started about 25 years ago where we took, we and others have taken eight founder mice, uh, as you see here, and by a series of, um, of, of random crosses developed uh, subsets that we went underwent um, brother-sister pairing to develop recombinant inbred lines where each strain, the called CC strains, have the genetic rearrangements based on the, uh, the genetics of the original founders. So in this collaborative cross strain resource, every SNP can be attributable back to an original um, a founder mouse. And furthermore, each of these strains will have variations approaching 40 million variants uh, that approximates human uh, genetic variability. Now, the big question is, how do you then avoid uh, allogeneic rejection of a model, murine model cancer cell line? And we simply cross these CC lines with a uh, with the genetic background uh, of the tumor cell line, in this case, C57 black 6, to get an F1 that is a hybrid. These hybrids would then take the uh, C57 black 6 derived uh, tumors and will accept it as its own. And then, uh, but we, but each animal will have genetic variability. And by treating with anti-PD-1 therapeutic, which is what we chose as the agent, we're able to quantify the response. The first tumor cell line we use is the colon cancer MC38 uh, cell line, which is a murine colon cancer cell line. The C57 black 6 genetic background um, um, uh, for this tumor shows a distinct response because it was a great war workhorse for the, um, for the immunology field. But by putting the, these, that uh, MC38 cell line into different uh, F1 crosses, you see that there's a dramatic range of responses of these individual mice uh, that are clustered based on the, uh, the strain um, uh, composition. Anywhere from fantastic responses that are better than the C57 black 6 all the way to no response at all. Now, um, this allowed us to be quantitative and we wanted to ask the question, what is the proportion of the observable phenotypic variability that is response to ICI therapeutic that can be attributed to genetic, post-genetic variants? And this can be calculated using the broad sense heritability score H squared. The um, heritability for type two diabetes done in this manner is between 20 and 80%, usually around 40%. Height is 80%, as you know, height is heavily determined by genetics, migraine 40%, et cetera. We calculated using 33 uh, CC lines for MC38 that the heritability score is 42%, which suggests that a great proportion of the variability of response to anti-PD-1 um, therapy, therapy is due to host genetic variation. We expanded this heritability assessment into three other cell lines crossing two different um, genetic backgrounds, C57 black 6 and BALB C, and two different um, tumors of origin, breast and uh, mammary and colon. And in doing so, with smaller numbers of CC, we were able to, um, to show in three out of the four um, tumor cell lines that the heritability was statistically significant, and it ranged from 0.2 to 0.42, um, or 20% or 42%. Now, um, we started to ask the simple question of, is there something unique about each of these uh, tumor cell lines? And we find that the tumor mutational burden was similar between C50, it's the MC38 and CT26, and is actually relatively low in EMT6. The only distinction is that the MC38 it has an MSI uh, configuration and has a significant mutational load as well. Whether this is responsible for this variability of the H um, of the heritability, we don't know at this point, but we know that heritability is important. Well, with this resource, we can actually do some rough mapping. And by looking at these, um, these, these mice, 
we found that there was a distinct peak on mouse chromosome 15 that, ex, um, that crossed the, the multi-sampling uh, correction. Um, and when we looked at that, it, this interval is about a five megabase interval that spanned 20, uh, 74,000 variants, SNPs and indels. But using a trick of mouse genetics, we um, defined a haploblock uh, within this region that narrowed our search down to 233 sites instead of the 74,000. In the middle of this uh, and concentrated on, on this gene is actually NCF4. Um, now, we asked the plausibility by looking at gene expression of the tumors of responders and non-responders. We find that NCF4 is the highest expressor within that region. And furthermore, that has the greatest distinction, fold change between responder and non-responder lines. And the mean expression is uh, placed in this, in, this, um, uh, in this histogram on the right. Well, um, this NCF4 is very interesting because NCF4 encodes the P40 Fox subcomponent sub of the NADPH oxidase complex system. And there were three um, very plausible variations, uh, but two in the coding region, one in the three prime UTR, not to speak of the non-coding ones that distinguish the responder from the non-responder. Why were we excited about this is because NCF4 is a known modulator of innate immunity in human disease and human biology, as you see here, and is actually one of the key causes of chronic granulomatous disease um, when the mutation is a homozygous loss of function. Furthermore, other investigators in 2014, Kurt Harris's group, showed that a germline variation of this gene in humans uh, is associated with increased risk of colorectal car carcinoma, and a Chinese group had identified that markers in this complex are related to immune infiltration in renal uh, cell carcinoma, giving us a significant plausibility. Now, this could be simple association, but what we did was we went back and took a strain that is not part of the founder strain that diverged from Black 6 since 1920, um, but has a non-responder haplotype at NCF4 locus. And when we did the F1 cross between BLAB, black BALB C and BLAC6, um, the, with the functional haplotype being non-responder, the actually experimental phenotype was also a non-response phenotype. This suggested that we're really on target um, at this locus of NCF4. But on top of that, this gave us an idea, uh, a suggestion that the um, non-responder phenotype is, uh, is actually the dominant phenotype in this uh, approach. Now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, uh, immunologist John Graham, who will walk you through the immunophenotyping and the immunologic analysis of these tumors. Thanks, Ed. Next slide. So for our immunophenotyping efforts, we used six strains total, uh, three being a, a extreme responder strains. So basically they have 100% complete responses versus uh, three of the worst performing strains, basically showing no responses. And to investigate these, we used what we call a single dose model, which consists of engrafting mice with the MC38 tumors and then when these tumors reach a certain size window, which we've empirically determined to be a size window associated with subsequent response to anti-PD-1, uh, we give them a single dose of anti-PD-1 or isotype control within this window. And then 48 hours later, we harvest the mice and uh, tumors to do our immunophenotyping assays, which consists of flow cytometry and single cell RNA-seq experiments. So I'm just going to bullet point the flow cytometry findings. Uh, we saw in comparisons of the responder strain tumors to non-responder strain tumors that the magnitude of immune cell infiltration was not significantly different. Therefore, we think that uh, genetics really plays a, a minimal to no role in just the overall magnitude of immune cell infiltration in tumors. That being said, however, we did see enrichment of CD8 positive T cells or cytotoxic lymphocytes 
Uh, this, of course, confirms what is well known in the clinic and uh, what is known from animal models that have over decades now shown that CD8 T cells are necessary and sufficient for anti tumor immunity. Another interesting finding was uh, we saw this interesting population of macrophages that were enriched in. Uh, responder strain tumors, and these were characterized as having the highest levels of PDL1 expression as well as MHC class 2. Next slide, please. So, to jump into the single cell RNA seq uh, data, uh, we of course took our same six strains, the three responders and three non responders, and used our single dose model. And over the course of these uh, experiments, we collected a total of 47 MC38 tumors from these six strains. We recovered approximately 95,000 quality controlled cells, and that breaks down to approximately 2,000 cells for each of those 47 tumors. When we compared or broke our data set into responder strain tumors versus non responder strain tumors and did subclustering based on gene expression, uh, we looked at the frequencies of each of these subclusters and compared them between the two groups of uh, tumors. We saw that responder strain tumors were enriched uh, again for CTLs. So, in this case, we see two subclusters, uh, one showing signs of T cell exhaustion. So, they expressed high levels of tox and PD1 itself. And then another subcluster that looked like an effector CTL. Uh, uh, type of uh, immune cell that expressed the highest levels of interferon gamma out of all the subclusters, as well as uh, cytotoxic molecules like granzyme and perforin. So, because we saw these uh, really high interferon gamma secreting CTL, we wondered uh, w whether or not the uh, microenvironment of responder strain tumors uh, had a higher stimulation of interferon gamma. And to look at that, we used this mRNA response signature uh, from this paper here that actually used it to predict clinical responses to PD-1 blockade. And we, we see here, uh, just doing a pseudo bulk comparison, uh, the mean expression of this gene signature is elevated significantly in responder strain tumors versus non-responder strain tumors. So next slide, please. So, because we saw this elevation in interferon gamma response signatures, we decided to investigate which subsets or subclusters of cells differed the most between responders and non responders. And surprisingly, we saw that the macrophages were really the most uh, responsive in terms of, or, or the most stimulated uh, in terms of the interferon gamma response signature uh, when we compared the responder strain tumors to the non responder strain tumors. Next slide, please. With this data in hand, we decided to look at whether or not macrophages might be uh, directly interacting in the tumor with different CTL populations. And to do this, we used a, a new algorithm called cell chat, which is a cell cell communication algorithm. Uh, as you can see here in the circles plot on the left here, we have uh, three different subclusters of interferon gamma stimulated max. These are the three subclusters that express the highest interferon gamma response signature. You can see here that there are several interactions with CTLs uh, from our data set. And if we look more specifically on the right panel here, we see all of the significant interactions that the program pulled out between macrophages or DCs and CTLs. And we compared to DCs because it is well recognized that DCs are in the tumor and they are uh, considered one, the most uh, potent antigen presenting cell. However, the cell chat algorithm here, the one thing that uh, immediately strikes you is it, the box, the red box has more uh, bubbles in it than the right side of the panel uh, with the dendritic cells, implying that or inferring that uh, the interferon gamma stimulated macrophages uh, have more interactions than DCs do uh, with the two CTL subsets that we identified earlier on. So, next slide, please. So, because of this, we considered the following model that uh, responder strain tumors with their enhanced numbers of interferon gamma secreting CTLs are coming into the tumor secreting interferon gamma, which then stimulates intratumor macrophages to differentiate into uh, what are typically described as M1 like. Uh, macrophages uh, of the, that express things like CXCL9 and are, are PDL1 high. 
And on the left here is a pseudo time trace from a program called Monocle that uh, is, we're looking at the macrophages here and you can see in the box, there's two pseudo time extremes noted by the blue color and the red color. And what I'm showing you here is, and I don't have time to go into it in, in specifics, is that we do see something consistent with uh, uh, this gray macrophage on our model here, turning into this M1-like macrophage uh, in the middle of the slide. So next slide, please. So this has led us to uh, think about this in terms of a model. And we propose that responder strain tumors being enriched with PD-1 positive uh, interferon gamma secreting uh, cytotoxic lymphocytes are interacting with uh, these M1-like macrophages that are differentiating from that interferon gamma that are expressing high levels of PD-L1. And at, in comparison to non-responder tumors, uh, because of uh, the enrichment of these two cell subsets and the uh, inhibition provided between them by the PD-1, PD-L1 interaction, uh, the responder strain tumors are poised to respond to PD-1 blockade. So next slide, please. So next we wanted to consider, well, how does our NCF4 gene that we identified in our uh, chromosome 15 QTO, uh, how might this fit into the picture? So as Ed has already shown, uh, we know the responder strain tumors uh, express less NCF4. And that led us to consider, well, maybe uh, uh, the NADPH oxidase function is going to also be uh, decreased in responder strain tumors. So to test that, we uh, took macrophages directly from responder strain tumors and compared them to non-responder strain tumors using a ROS or reactive oxygen species specific dye. And as you can see here, consistent with the idea that NADPH oxidase function is decreased in responders, we also see less intracellular ROS in macrophages taken from responder strain tumors. Next slide. So to put this into the context of the literature, um, we need to utilize the somewhat overly simplistic M1, M2 macrophage uh, paradigm. So in the tumor, you can have M2 type macrophages, which are considered anti-inflammatory and promote tumors. Whereas uh, you can also have uh, pro-inflammatory M1 type macrophages, which have been shown to have anti-tumor activity. And of course, as highlighted here, interferon gamma is a driver of these M1 type macrophages. Interestingly, uh, it has been shown that NADPH and the reactive oxygen species they generate actually promote alternatively activated M2 macrophages uh, as opposed to M1 macrophages. So this really fits in with what we're seeing with an enrichment of interferon gamma stimulated macrophages in our responder strain tumors and relating this back to NCF4. Next slide, please. So in summary, we have responder strain uh, uh, NCF4 genetics, which lead to uh, less NCF4 activity, either through non-synonymous mutations or reduced NCF4 expression. This creates uh, reduced intracellular ROS or a reduced intracellular redox environment in, within tumors even. And this promotes uh, the differentiation of M1-like macrophages, as well as promotes in, in, in before uh, uh, therapy, it actually promotes increased antigen presentation and CTLs as well. So now I'm going to hand it back over to Ed to discuss future directions and conclusions. Well, obviously, this is a um, preclinical nearing model, but the question is, um, are our data relevant to, to um, a human uh, c clinical condition? And to do this, um, we took um, the genes that were identified from the single cell genomic analysis of only the immunocytes that dif differentiated responders from non-responders. Um, and uh, John selected these and with a cassette that we have, Ported it over to human data that was in the TIDE database. And this is a database that has some very significant um, genomic expression information re related, uh, that uh, related to actual response to various 
immune checkpoint inhibitors. We selected this one because there were significant numbers and it was anti-PD-1 therapeutic. And you see here that, st that this cassette alone uh, derived from murine data uh, of, of murine immuno, uh, immunologic uh, signatures actually could segregate out um, responders, um, uh, long-term survivors versus those who um, are, don't do so well in a statistically significant manner. Now, going forward, you know, we've already done 2,500 mice, and in doing so with a, another series of uh, genetic tricks, we've identified not only on the, um, the chromosome 15 peak, but two other peaks as well. This suggests that, um, and this is just for MC38, that the host genetics of ICI response will be uh, heterogeneous and, um, and uh, multivaried. And so this is going to keep us busy going uh, going forward. Now the rev, rev, uh, relevance for you, my colleagues at at, at Swag, is that we're we are uh, we are presenting a plausible germline diagnostic to identify individual at risk for failing ICI treatment. Um, and a separate project that you will hear about, um, we have um, ideas on that the genetic loci for. Yeah, immune um, uh, uh, immune determined uh, adverse adverse events. Um, what we presented for you also is a mechanism based RNA diagnostics as opposed to an association based diagnostic to assess tumor immune configuration that has um, translational plausibility. And of course, we're going to be mining our data for potential future targets for modulation to enhance ICI efficacy. My hope is that this conversation and this presentation um, will spark some uh, some lively conversations on how we, as as a Southwest Oncology Group, should band together, prepare for these uh, germline assessments of responders versus non-responders, and to have a, a mechanism-based RNA diagnostic can, that can be tested in our populations. So at this point, I want to thank you for your time. Um, unfortunately, uh, uh, I'm not going to be available for questions, but John and our colleagues who are present at the meeting uh, will do so. So thank you again. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Yu and Dr. Graham for that really interesting uh, presentation. So uh, the floor is open for questions. If anybody ha has questions in the room, please uh, come up to the microphones and also people can place questions in, um, in the chat box. I just would like to confirm that uh, John Graham is uh, available to answer questions. Yes, I'm right here. Okay, great. Um, where? On, on, on Zoom, right? Yes. I see you on Zoom. Okay, thank you. So um, great, we have uh, a question. Uh, okay. Please sure. go ahead. Yes. Hi, Robert Tanstein here. Great talk um, and really, uh, you know, intriguing results. I'm wondering, one of the few associations on the germline side that have been shown in patient data in terms of response to ICI has been sort of HLA associations, whether it's heterozygosity or particular alleles or supertypes. And I'm wondering if you're surprised that you haven't seen HLA come up in these sort of mouse back cross particularly given in the context of the toxicity data, you had to introduce a particular HLA allele that maybe had the ability to present some of those key antigens. So are the antigens not driving the response in these, in these particular mouse models or I guess? So yeah, I can answer that. So in one respect, yes, going into this, I was surprised that we didn't get some hits on the HLA. We actually haven't seen any. Uh, however, with our model system, uh, half the genome of the mice uh, is B6. So uh, presumably we use an MHC class one tetramer that uh, focuses on a specific epitope MC38. And in all the mice we've looked at in those responder strains versus non-responder strain type comparisons, we see CTLs that stain with that MHC class one tetramer. So I don't, I don't think there's, uh, there's the potential for variation in antigens recognized by each unique immune system, but there's still that shared component, which uh, is 
obviously providing enough response. Thank you. <laughs> we have a question in the chat from Dr. Espinoza. He says, uh, great presentation. Some of these changes in the microenvironment are thought to be epigenetic in nature. And we see this in the clinic when, for example, cachectic patients are less likely to be non-responders. Are there any efforts to see if these clinical changes have any impact on the tumor microenvironment? Additionally, there, are there current antibodies in development that seek to overcome T cell ex exhaustion? Are you planning to evaluate these medications like anti-LAG3 and TIM3 or uh, anti-CD47 in the non ICI non-responder models? Yeah, so uh, we actually have uh, started, initiated a Cachexia project in addition to, uh, in, in the similar kind of format as this project and the one that you saw before from Dr. Sorez. Uh, so we will be looking at the effects of Cachexia uh, as well as the IRAs on uh, response ultimately. Uh, we are very interested in looking at different checkpoint inhibitors, in particular, starting out with just CTLA-4, since it's the uh, other checkpoint inhibitor that's been uh, licensed. And it, that's particularly interesting to us because PD-1, uh, the main mechanism of action happens in the peripheral tissues, whereas CTLA-4 blockade really starts uh, where the immune response happens in the secondary lymph nodes and things of that nature, kind of at the top of the process. So we would expect we would see very different QTL uh, doing our scan again with the CTLA-4 blockade. So that was a good question. Thank you. Thank you. I was wondering whether you think that you may see different loci with different tumor models, like from different origins, and or if you do these experiments in orthotopic um, uh, locations versus uh, with subcutaneous tumor models. So uh, we, we do very much expect, because of the differences in the heritability, that there will be different mechanisms and different genetic underpinnings of those mechanisms. So uh, moving forward, we do want to uh, repeat what we did with the MC38 colorectal cancer, with the breast cancers and the other CT26 uh, colorectal cancer. Thank you. And, yeah. and then... Uh, just another another question regarding the ROS. Do you think that if you could sort of pharmacologically modulate ROS, you might phenocopy some of the effects of the MCF4 mutations? Is there a way of doing that? That's that? what the ultimate hope is, I think, is to bring about a, a balance of ROS that favors the ICI response and favors antigen presentation and M1 macrophage differentiation. And uh, right now, you know, we're doing proof of concept that the NADPH oxidase enzyme through NCF4 has a role in that. Once we cement that down, then uh, we intend to uh, use these models to actually test a question like that with pharmaceuticals that uh, may come our way. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the presentation. And um, thank you for being here uh, so late on the East Coast um, to uh, answer answer questions um, and uh, speak today. And um, thank you. So I'd like to thank uh, the, pleasure, the first thanks. three speakers. Um, and um, I think this has uh, hopefully given us all some ideas and sort of stimulated some thoughts on how the genetics and how our germline genetics may be influencing both the, the response to immune checkpoint inhibitors and um, the immune related adverse events that we see in patients. So these are things to keep in mind. And I, I, I think that we're gonna see this field really uh, develop tremendously in the coming years. I am uh, now going to turn the microphone over to Dr. Hula Scoven, who is going to um, chair the next part of this session. Thank you, Katie. So um, as many of you know, and we have presented um, in the past meeting several times, um, the Iowa committee, SWAC Iowa committee is leading the efforts 
um, helping NCI to develop the immunomatch platform. Um, so our next two speakers will focus on uh, giving us an update uh, about the biomarker development um, for iMatch and also uh, an update about uh, iMatch pilot study, which will be launched soon. Um, so our first speaker is Dr. Um, Bishu Das from the uh, MOCA lab. So he is a principal scientist um, in uh, MOCA lab at the uh, Frederick National Lab. And he uh, received his PhD degree um, in molecular biology from India and uh, did postdoc study in development, developmental biology under Dr. Donald Brown at Carnegie Institution uh, for Science. And then he joined uh, Frederick National Lab in 2010 and has been um, working at MOCA Lab um, in the past nine years. Um, so he has, uh, uh, Dr. Daz has contributed to multiple NCI clinical trials and clinical uh, preclinical studies, um, and also um, trials um, at uh, ETCTN, uh, NCI, uh, MP, ACT, et cetera. So Dr. Daz, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Uh, um, so I thank you everybody for inviting me for the presentation here. So I will start sharing the screen. I hope it works well. Uh, first of all, can you, everybody hear me in terms of audio? Uh, we can hear, I think. Do people in the okay. audience hear you can hear? Yes, everybody can hear, so. Okay, so, so let me just set it up. Um, so I'm Pishudas, I'm from um, Molecular Calculation Lab, we call ourselves MOCA. Um, so it is in Frederick, Maryland, and it's Frederick National Lab. It's um, used to be part of NCI, now we are independent national lab. So I will give you, um, so in the next slide, this is my overview of the presentation. So initially I'll just tell you who we are, what we do, and then I will get into the iMatch biomarker plan. And I will spend a lot of time in this NCI clinical whole exome assay, which you'll be using for reporting out TND. And then, um, the, so I will get into that. And then there's another biomarker which is TSCO, which will be generating using nanostring IO360 assay. And then I will also briefly touch upon some biomarker assays, other biomarkers we have planned for iMatch pilot. And finally, um, this will be open discussion. I like to know uh, from you what you like to see in these biomarker plans, which we, we are collecting multiple samples from. So with that, I will just go briefly. I'll just, I'll not spend much time here, but just to establish uh, where, who we are as molecular gradation lab. So MOCA was established in, nine, in 2010 by NCI um, at NCI Frederick uh, at that time to provide state-of-the-art genomic learning support of NCI clinical trials and preclinical studies. So our capabilities start from receipt of clinical specimens, um, histology, enrichment of tumor, and then going all the way from that to extraction nucleic acid uh, to NGS assay or any other genomic assay, and finally the results. And our expertise is in genomic assay development and validation as well as setting up lab networks to harmonize lab networks to provide um, same results coming from patients. So we set up, and, and then I'll just get into that a little bit in terms of the projects or clinical trials we are involved in. We are sub, we served as the hub lab for NCI match trial and, and NCI PAPES match trial. Initially NCI match trial was a central screening um, also, and we screened about 6,500 patients with the, in the lab network. Uh, this was again, a harmonized lab network of five labs. So, and then it went to outside lab network, which we also provide expertise to set up um, to, uh, to have harmonized results from that. 
And then we support NCI impact trial. We also have established another lab network to support um, ETCTN studies, uh, NCI ETCTN studies. So this is called NCI Clinical Laboratory Network. So there are MD Anderson and us are part of that network currently in genomic side. And then we also currently establishing this MDNet laboratories to support the next generation of NCI precision medicine initiatives, which are um, which are succession um, in in which are kind of um, after the NCI match trial successor to NCI match. These are Milo match, Combo match, and Immuno match or I match. We are also involved in multiple public-private consortiums with NCI and other organizations. We serve as reference lab for multiple um, obvious consortium, for example, Friends of Cancer TMB harmonization project. Um, and finally, we are also involved, very much involved in genomic characterization of all the NCI PDX models and other clinical models from NCI PDMR. So those are preclinical studies. Uh, so I'm jump directly into IMATCH pilot trial. So the the investigators, the PIs are Dr. Kuliskoven, Dr. Politi, and Dr. Suweki. Um, it's called bicasal trial. So biomarker strat stratified capacitive and nivolumab in patients with uh, patients who have uh, CTI, refractory melanoma, or head and neck. So I show you here the the schema, very high level schema of the trial. So the, these patients have been progressed in PD-1 and they, and you already know, many of you probably already heard it. I just want to set up the stage what I'm going to talk about next. So there are two sludges, melanoma and head and neck. Um, will be the patients, uh, those patients will be enrolled who progress in PD-1 therapies. And then um, the patients would be biopsied. The IMAX screening platform, which will be testing for two biomarkers one is TMB, the other is tumor inflammation score. And these would be then initially will be in the stage one. Uh, the patients will not wait for the assay results to go into the, to, go, to be enrolled in the trial in the stage one. So in the stage one, we are, uh, so there's 45 to 60 patients. Um, we are testing for feasibility of the platform. Uh, we are testing that um, that the 75 of the patients get enrolled in the trial. Um, I'd say enrolled. They they have their results back and stratified within the first 21 days after biopsy. So it's a very quick turnaround, and that I will point out in the next part of the talk. In the stage two, the treatment if assigned, the we'll start putting patients in different subgroups and the subgroups are four subgroups. For each histology, there will be 15 patients in each subgroup. So if with two histologies, it will be 30 patients. And these subgroups are either high TMB, so, or, and based on the, the T score and the TMB. So it's high, 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 low, low, high, or low, low. So those are the four subgroups. And um, finally, cruel would be like around uh, 120 patients. Um, so that's, those are the four subgroups. Or, uh, and then the integral biomarkers, as I mentioned already, would be TMB from the whole exome assay. And the cutoff will be using as 10 mutations per megabase. And the, for the T score, um, we'll be using cutoff of six, and it, it's on a scale of one to 12. Um, I'll get into that little bit. I touched upon it the retrospective assays and the analysis. So we'll be using RNA seq, CD8, IHC, multi, uh, multiplex immunofluorescence, PDL1, IHC, or as well as CFDNA. So these, um, I'll get into that a little bit later. So these are the tissue-based biomarker overall for this for this IMATCH pilot, um, and this is straight up. I am showing you the table which normally goes into the LOI for the for the CTEP LOI. So this is 
first and it shows in the priority based on the left hand side left column shows the priority of these biomarkers and obviously tmb is the first one integral biomarker so integral i think most of you probably know what integral and integrated and exploratory biomarkers are. Maybe I'll just mention briefly. Integrals are biomarkers, are, um, are biomarkers which are used for patient stratification um, or um, putting patient on some, um, some arm. And then in integrated biomarkers are we are, there is a hypothesis in this trial which we are using this biomarker to um, answer. So that those are integrated biomarkers and then there are exploratory biomarkers which we can build future hypotheses based on those exploratory biomarkers. So those are three different classes of biomarkers CTEP uses, uh, NCI CTEP uses. So that, those are biomarkers I listed in this table. So as you can see, the X on TMB and the tumor inference score are integral biomarkers because we are, patient, we are stratifying the patients based on these two biomarkers. And then there is PDL1, and I mentioned CD8 can be also part of it. And as well as remember, this TMB is coming from whole exome assay. Um, we are using um, just a TMB as stratification, but the other parts of this whole exome. Um, all the mutations, copy numbers, all of them can be used as integrated biomarkers. And we also will plan to do RNA-seq for gene expression assay for this. Um, so these time points are marked in the second to last column. And for blood-based biomarker, we have, um, obviously we need the germline hold, uh, from blood um, for from the PPMCs for, um, as germline control for the whole exome for identifying somatic mutations. We also have cell tree DNA assays as well as other biomarkers I listed here uh, as exploratory biomarkers as well as integrated biomarkers. Uh, one of the reason we like TSO 500 or ctDNA assays for integrated biomarkers because not only we can explore, um, we, can, we can take different time points, but since these are less invasive, we, and in our experience, only seven to 10% of the patients actually give biopsy at progression. So we really don't understand what happens in progression. So that's why we think cell-free DNA assays are a good biomarker or good assays because they are least invasive and we see compliance close to 80 to 90% compliance from patients um, to give blood at progression or other time points. So that's why we like that as a, as a uh, biomarker for, especially at the progression time point. Um, so I'll move a little bit quickly now. So we have set up this MDE net laboratories. Um, so iMatch is one of the initiatives and in Mocha and MD Anderson will run this um, whole exome assay for TMD and other action variants. We are also subcontracting um, some contractation organizations or CROs to run ISO, ISO 360 assay to generate P score. Um, these organizations are very well versed on this IO360 assay with nanostring. So we think they will do a really good turnaround and a good uh, job on that. In additional assays, we plan to do that could be run by other labs, including MD Anderson and other labs maybe. So I'll just go into quickly to this NCI clinical whole exome assay. This is the assay we are developing in house to support this IMATCH trial as well as combo match trial. And we already support etc in trial to this. Um, this one, the, one of the things we want to use this whole exome assay for is to generate clinical report for each patient who have been screened for this IMATCH. So any patients who are giving biopsy for IMATCH will get a clinical report. Um, this overall, the target is 400, uh, sorry, 44 megabits target region. And this, the other reason this is important because we were the standard lab, uh, we were the reference lab for the Friends of Cancer TMB harmonization project, which um, the um, 
which kind of was used to harmonize multiple commercial vendors with these 10 mutations per, uh, mutations per megabase cutoff for TMB high and TMB low. So we want to use the same region so that the data is very comparable with the friend of cancer TMB harmonization project um, and all the other vendors who participated in that. So we can actually see where, where our TNB cutoffs are when we retrospectively analyze the data. So in terms of clinical report, we'll be using 675 genes and we specifically spiked in additional probes in this region to get better capture. Um, we also included intronic regions in this panel. So we can identify fusion genes to um, we have also multiple other things pro, uh, here, for example, LOH regions, uh, so that uh, we have additional pros across the whole genome. Um, we also will obviously report MSI and HLA class one typing. Uh, we also probed in seven oncogenic viruses uh, in this probe set. Um, one of the major things we are looking for is very quick turnaround time. In, for this pro, uh, for prospect reporting. We are turning this assay, this whole exome assay in our lab in about six to seven days, which is really fast. Um, so in the next slide, I'm just going through a little bit more. Prospectively, we are reporting out only 675 genes and, um, and TMB. As I mentioned before, there are other biomarkers which are listed here we can always, from the same assay, we'll be getting these biomarkers too. Um, this is quick summary of the overall um, pipeline we are using. One of the things I just put in there is um, for, we are using a, um, a specific uh, server from Illumina called Dragon Server, this Illumina Dragon platform. It can run really fast the whole pipeline can be run in 50 minutes to generate all these biomarkers I mentioned before. So all of those biomarkers are run on this, on this pipeline. The other advantage of this pipeline, because this is modular and, and we are trying to build a lab network which is harmonized. So we can just install this server in that lab network in the other lab, for example, MD Anderson, and they will get exactly same data. Um, all of these will be reporting out from um, using Onco KB, and this is like NCI Cloud. All of this data will be uploaded there and re clinical report generated using this, um, these tools I listed here. And then I will just quickly go through some technical, um, uh, technical details of this platform. Um, so we have, so far, I'll just show you just the feasibility part of the data which is generated in the feasibility. We are right in the middle of validation right now. So I'm not going to show you the validation data in um, what we have seen so far. So I'm just showing you the feasibility data. So, so far we have seen excellent feasibility as well as both for TMB as well as for SNB indels and copy numbers. Um, in terms of LOD, I'll just quickly jump to this. In terms of um, TMB, we see again, very good sensitivity. Uh, this is just to show that this assay, even though the recommended input is 100 nanogram genomic DNA, even with 25 nanogram genomic DNA, we get excellent results and in terms of TMB. And this is also true, I'm not showing you the data, also true for CNV, SNV and CNV indels. In terms of creation overall um, of the day assay, so these are typically we measure creation, specificity, sensitivity, and the previously of the assays, which we, uh, which we use for uh, integral assays, for clear assays. So this is, I'm showing you one, quickly I'm showing you some um, data on the creation of this assay for different uh, mutations. So this is, for example, AKT1 mutations run six times and um, the allele frequency is excellent overall in this assay. Um, in terms of um, TMB, uh, in terms of, I 
do not see the top of my um, slides actually. So uh, overall, we see from multiple reportable variants, we see also very good uh, precision. I'm showing you that data here. Um, so in, in terms of um, overall TNB, this is the TNB data. And again, we see very excellent precision overall in the TMB data. Um, and um, I maybe point out the last line here, endometrial, which is right around the cutoff of TMB high. We really wanted to probe that cutoff area. So this is around 12 mutations per megabase. And we see excellent precision around that region. And that's we, we like we'll adding more samples during our validation to explore the precision around the cutoff, uh, TMB cutoff of 10 mutants and megabits. Um, and this is a copy number precision data. And again, over multiple replicates in multiple genes, we see excellent um, copy number values, very consistent copy number values across multiple replicates. Um, so this is overall, I, I just browsed through very fast to the technical performance of this assay. Um, we, and this is the reportable range we expect to see after validation that SNV9 DELs would be reported at 5% allele frequencies. CNVs we plan to report at five copies or more. Um, TNB will report between five and 20. Beyond 20, it's TNB high and it's, um, it's the precision falls a little bit. And below five again, um, it's TMB very much low. So we'll report as TMB below five. Um, and we'll report the integer as TMB uh, five or six or whatever between five and 20. And I have shown you the acceptance criteria here for the article validation we are going through right now. And we expect to hit this acceptance criteria with the validated assay. Um, so that's pretty much in the, for the clinical exam assay. And this is the team, this is a big team we have. Um, they do uh, for um, generate, for developing this assay at MOCA. And as MD Anderson come online, they will be participating in their validation too. And then I will quickly go into the other assays just in next uh, couple of slides. Um, so one is the T-score I mentioned. And this will be generated by nanostring IO360 assay and we'll be using a CRO lab I mentioned before for this. And we plan to use T score cutoff at six uh, for separating out the T's high and low. We may, um, we may change it after the initial, um, the first 60 patients will evaluate and may change the cutoff if we think we um, the the beans are unbalanced, so there are discussions ongoing, and um, and then also we we as I mentioned before, RNA seq pdl one CD8 IHCs, these are integrated assays. Um, we are considering multiplex IFA as exploratory assay, as I mentioned before, um, CFDNA, TCR. Um, TCR sequencing as well as other assays I think also considered for blood-based biomarkers. And they are collected at multiple time points. And that's, I think I, I will end there and I will definitely answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I, this is uh, very helpful. Um, you know, especially the initial introduction of the MOCA lab, um, it's very helpful for our members to understand um, the important role MOCA lab plays in all these um, NCI trials, uh, especially the ones that um, are biomarker heavy. Um, so I have a question uh, about, um, you know, developing assays um, in the MOCA lab. So there are uh, companies, you know, sequencing companies, uh, many of them out there, right? And, um, you know, they develop clinical tests. Um, so what, um, what are the criteria and how uh, do you 
um, you know, evaluate pros and cons to use those um, those uh, commercial labs versus um, you know developing these assays um, yourself. And how do you uh, make that decision? Um, you know, what's the uh, whether you want to work with a uh, a lab uh, a commercial lab or you know developing the um, the assay yourself. So that's an excellent question. It's always a um, few things we take into consideration in terms of resources, as well as um, harmonization of the assay. That's the harder ones because um, maybe I'll just give an example of NCI match, our experience. The first 6,500 patients were screened using the central lab, central screening uh, lab network. Um, afterwards, we move to this, what we call designated lab network. So these are right now 28 labs are there, including foundation, medicine, caries, um, tempus, all of them are there. They send patients um, screen through their assay into the, into the NCI match protocol. Um, Part of the reason we, there are still, there are issues to that. For, and that's why I said like, it's, I'm giving you that example. Copy number, for example, in NCI match, there are multiple arms which are using copy number cutoffs and different labs report out copy number differently. So the same samples. So when we actually qualify this lab, we send them initially 10 samples, 10 clinical samples. Um, and same sample, different lab reported different copy numbers. And it was a hard, and we actually tried to normalize it in the back end, which is hard because some labs take tumor content into consideration, some labs don't. And especially for TMB, we felt that each of the labs, and obviously there's foundation medicine is, um, is well known in the field because they are using, they have like a um, CDX biomarker, right? Um, a class C biomarker um, in the class C device for TMB reporting. But we found that even then there are differences other than foundation medicine, other labs don't report out TMB at the same way. And I can, you probably are aware of the TMB harmonization project from a post CR we mentioned, there is a huge gap between labs in TMB reporting. So that's why initially we thought uh, that we'll be using internal lab, uh, the central lab network for this. Um, we'll, at the same time, we'll be evaluating outside labs and see how we are comparing with that. And that will maybe at some point, we probably will use the same, comp same um, NCI match paradigm of designated lab network to get patients enrolled. Yeah, I can feel the pain. You know, each of these companies have their own developed assets and they are all slightly different, right? How do you consolidate those results in the end? It's, um, you know, they have to be yeah. carefully considered. Um, so uh, Nicole uh, Kruder um, has a uh, question for you. She said, uh, congrats and uh, terrific TMB data. Uh, breast cancer has interesting uh, substantial response in, uh, increase for TMB more than 14. Um, so, um, you know, it's, uh, uh, it might be interesting to pre-specify TMB 14 as a cut point to find the responders in other cold ICI tumors or for other um, low performing drugs. Um, so I think she, um, Nicole, feel free to turn on your, um, your speaker, um, you know, or your mic um, to ask yourself, but I think you're asking uh, whether we should use a cutoff of 14 uh, oh, in no, the no. trial, right? Oh, no, 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 So not at all. Oh, thank you. I'm so glad you're, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear yes. you. I'm not too loud yeah. or too soft? Yeah, uh, not too loud. Okay. Um, no, I not instead. I was just wondering, uh, you know, if you, uh, this is really interesting as breast cancer is such a challenge for ICI as well as for TMB. You know, it's about 20% with TMB of 10 cut point. 
and it, you know, it's such a cold tumor. So it, it's just borderline response rate, even at TMB 10. And so the TMB 14, it's a small cord, but it is, it was pre-specified and um, it's kind of an interesting new cut point that the breast community will be exploring. And I'm thinking, could this be a, a prototype potentially for other difficult tumors where 10 might also be a challenge? And if you had it pre-specified, uh, I, I don't think you can probably go much higher than this um, as, as it's small n, I think above four, 14 for most tumors anyway. Um, but could this be another cut point where, you know, so rather than discarding that drug that with TMB10, um, could this be a pre-specified cut point to maybe rescue some drugs or rescue some tumors along the way? I'm just, just thinking outside the box a little, you know, it's, it's early days for this cut point. As a secondary cut point, I'm thinking, not not as the primary scene. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, just just mm -hmm. FII. Sure. Uh, you don't even need yeah. to respond. Uh, just to put this info out there for you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Nicole. I, um, this is something yeah. we discuss, um, you know, almost yeah. <laughs> every month. So we have, <laughs> we are having. The um, yeah. So uh, Bishu, do you want to respond to that uh, from your angle? So I can I say, say one thing, one right? In uh, this iMatch pilot is actually a very good example with two histologies and all patients are getting the same drug, right? So retrospectively, we can check what is the nice cut point. Is there any difference between two histologies in terms of cut point uh, to specifically answer your question? But initially, um, we are setting this cut point based on the existing literature. Um, obviously, the literature is very sparse in terms of head and neck uh, compared to melanoma. But still, that's the initial cut point. But since it's stratification only, we can always check retrospectively what the cut point should have been. And, and, and this was maybe again, even as a secondary cut point, you know, not what it maybe even, mm -hmm. you know, just so if you have it pre-specified in, you know, for your analysis, um, let's say we were also going to check the secondary cut point on the line. Um, it, it you know it makes it more valid, more interesting. Um, once TMB ten fails, or again is is limited for certain tumors. Yeah, I, I think we'll do regression analysis, right? So, and I think we we plan to do that mm -hmm. later on. Um, so yeah, that's why we have a pilot study just to test yeah. out. You know, there won't be one perfect cut cutoff for all patients across all tumor types. So uh, this is, um, you know, currently we use a cutoff of 10, um, Nicole, uh, because of the published literature. Of course. Um, yeah, but, you know, definitely uh, we will do retrospective study afterwards and see whether that's a reasonable cutoff or not across different disease types. I have a, uh, this is Katie, uh, a quick question uh, for Bishu. Uh, thank you very much for that presentation. That was great. Just wondering for uh, the audience here, if um, you, this clinical holexome that you've been working on and developing is great. And so if people are interested in incorporating that and in working with Mocha Labs in their clinical trials, is that possible? Um, is that something that can happen or is this really, um, uh, you know, how, how does that work? You, you know, you mentioned that the NCI yeah. Precision Cancer Initiatives, the ETCTN, how does that work if someone has a swab trial and would like to work with Mocha Labs? <laughs> so unfortunately, I think we need to go to NCI ultimately. So the way it works is for ETCTN trial, we are su supporting all the ETCTN trials um, based on that. Uh, but um, outside of that, other than the patient medicine initiatives we are supporting, we normally don't support those trials. Now, <laughs> it, it is true that MD Anderson will get the same assay, right? So they will also be able to support it. Um, just pointing you to the other direction that they may be able to support it. If not, we cannot do that because we are bound by certain um, certain contractual obligations with NCI. So we cannot do beyond what our, um, our um, scope is, yep. what NCI sets up. 
Thank you. Okay. I'm not sure I answered the question, but I tried to be <laughs> as clear as possible that we support it. So for example, all the CIMAC trials, right? That is being, uh, many ETCTN trials are supported by also CIMAC, mm -hmm. which is three networks, are sub three labs are doing it right now, Broad and MD Anderson, right? So they are, they are not using this assay, but they are using a version of, very similar version of that, which Broad developed. Um, I think many of you may be aware of that. Great, thank you very much, thanks. Yeah, thank you very much, Bishu, for this excellent yeah. talk. Um, and thank you for um, coming to our committee meeting this late. I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, thank you. Yeah, so our next speaker is um, Dr. Paul uh, Suwisiki um, from the University of Michigan. Uh, he's a head and neck uh, specialist, and he's a co-leader of the IMATCH pilot uh, study. So um, Paul graduated from um, Michigan State College of uh, Human Medicine for his MD degree. And then he did his uh, residency at the Mayo Clinic in uh, Rochester, Minnesota. Um, and then he was uh, mentored by um, doctors Robert Kyle and um, uh, Merle uh, Gers, <laughs> sorry, Paul, uh, prior to uh, coming to uh, University of Michigan for his uh, fellowship uh, in hematology and oncology. Um, so, Paul, um, I will uh, let you to further introduce yourself um, and the, I, uh, the update on IMAGE pilot. No, no, no. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and some of these slides will look um, very familiar. Bishu did a better job than I at presenting them. And so once again, thank you all so much um, for being here. The East Coast, it's a little bit darker than the West Coast, um, but presenting on behalf of CWIN as well as uh, Katie here in the, uh, the pilot trial of CABO plus NEVO and advanced solid tumors. So head and neck, um, squamous cell carcinoma and melanoma represent the ideal population for a biomarker stratified study. These are both immunologically diverse tumors, both between the two and within the disease cohorts. They're minimal to biopsy for real-time characterization rather than relying on historical biopsies. And also within each, there's preliminary evidence of independent predictive biomarkers. Um, first off, the nanostring interferon gamma signature, there's data from both, especially for adenic cancer, um, showing that this is independent of TMB and PDL1. In fact, perhaps a better predictive response is shown in the upper panel um, from the original 2017 paper. Um, as we'll get into a moment, although this was a, a great paper based on the keynote studies, we do not have the cutoff that they used for prediction of response, but still uh, demonstrates its promise. TMB, we've heard about in the last five minutes alone about uh, being a predictive biomarker. And we've seen now that this is independent of PDL1. It really shows a different aspect of the immune uh, microenvironment. Both these um, cancers also have low activity single agent therapy, and there's a lack of efficacious agents once they're refractory IO. So why melanoma and head and neck? I'm a little bit biased by head and neck, but it was based on this, pa uh, this paper from, uh, from 2018, considering of the different events malignancies, what is an, um, a good equal distribution of TMB high, TMB low, as well as an inflamed uh, microenvironment and a non-inflamed microenvironment? And lo and behold, melanoma, we can see a good distribution, I'm not going to say equal. And similarly, head and neck cancer has a relatively good proportion of the TMB and uh, inflamed uh, tumor, um, uh, tumor phenotype here. And so hence those were chosen amongst the biopsy considerations for this IMATCH pilot. So why the drugs? VEGF is in, involved in immunomodulation. This has come to light in the last few years, and even in the talk earlier from the Jackson, uh, the Jackson lab group. Uh, VEGF is more than just on blood vessels. We know that now inhibition has activity across numerous cell types in the immune microenvironment with the inhibition of dendritic cell uh, differentiation, alteration of interferon gamma uh, production, as well as chemotaxis, recruitment of tumor-associated macrophages, induction and maintenance of Tregs, and accumulation of MBSCs. Linvatinib Pembro, this is a little bit dated now, but it's now approved for, I believe, over four different malignancies. And we're seeing that it's a significant um, synergy between the two. 
um, and head and neck cancer specifically the spirit been an area of interest for my research group. We've shown that this regulation VEGF is um, seen in almost every single cancer and that there's activity with single agent uh, VEGF inhibitors, including bevacizumab, serafinib, sinitib, and um, Cabozatinib was chosen for several reasons. This is a multipotent, uh, it's a very potent multi-receptor titers and kinase inhibitor and uh, has a, a great IC50 against uh, VEGFR2. Also targets CMED as well as Axel. Uh, which both these are known to be um, um, aberrantly expressed in both head and neck squamous cell carcinoma as well as melanoma. Furthermore, CABO plus NEVO has been shown to be promising and safe in phase one and two trials. So by CAZO, that's the official abbreviation for this phase two trial combining cabozatinib and nivolumab in patients with advanced solid tumors, head and neck, and melanoma, stratified by tumor biomarkers. My hypothesis is the molecular characterization by TMB as well as by TIS, uh, will be a feasible for upfront uh, patient stratification, and that the combination of these two agents uh, will be efficacious uh, in different tumors with different, um, the different immune characterizations. Of course, before undertaking the entire eye match, the NCI uh, wanted to see if this is feasible. So in a rather unique primary endpoint, we want to show that it is in fact feasible to turn around results um, within 21 days. Uh, furthermore, we want to show the efficacy of the combination uh, shown by the response rate. And then finally, the response rate between the subgroups is a secondary endpoint. That is between TMB high, TMB low, and then also between TIS high and TIS low. This may look eerily familiar. We may have seen it just a couple minutes ago. Um, but in brief, as we heard, there's two stages. The first stage um, 60 patients are going to be accrued with no pre-screening per se. Uh, during that time, uh, there will there'll be um, biomarker evaluation on the back end. After the first half, there'll be a temporary hold, and that's the point which there'll be a two-step registration process. Patients will be registered, tissue sent centrally, sequencing as well as um, TIS uh, performed. And at that point, they'll be um, registered to one of the groups. As, one, as the groups fill up, um, they will be close to enrollment there. Uh, currently, we've talked once again about TMB cutoff being at 10, and TIS high is being considered at six, based on the uh, expected distribution in the literature. However, compared to where we were at in the fall when I last presented this, um, a great topic came up at the NCI in that there's no validation for this cutoff point. So we've gone back to um, the statistical plan, and in stage one, we are really evaluating at the feasibility analysis where we are with the distribution of, uh, of patients after stage one is completed and if this needs to be moved around. Eligibility won't bother anybody with this. Um, it's pretty general. Uh, people with hemoptysis, central lung lesions are excluded. Uh, prior treatment of VEGF inhibitors are excluded. And patients must have a documented progression within 12 weeks of the last dose of PD-1. Uh, calendar is pretty straightforward. And statistical plan, as before mentioned, the primary endpoint is uh, success rate of biomarker turnaround, um, the goals within 21 days. Um, and then as we talked about objective response rate in the molecular subgroups, that is by TMB high versus low and then TIS high versus low. And then response probability of 20% of greater would be of, uh, of interest. And then as we talked about TIS cup point has not been established, but we're using the uh, previous literature um, to start this off and at the feasibility analysis, reconsidering whether the gene needs to be moved up or down. Um, we've changed st uh, stats significantly. I see Katie Minicello is on here. Um, Mike uh, Blanc was, uh, um, did not, uh, was not able to join, but I think they deserve all the credit in the last few months. Um, and I'm very happy to report that with Dana's, uh, Dana's help, we finally have a completed staff, uh, a completed protocol and we're beating that back, hopefully um, prompt approval here. Hopefully next time we're talking, we're enrolling patients, but that's all I have. Open any questions and thank you very much. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, I don't see any question coming from, um, from the Zoom audience yet. Um, Katie, is there any question from, uh, from the site, from the, um, I, I the audience don't see over there? Right now. But if anybody has any questions, please feel free to come up to the mics and, and ask them.
No questions so far here, Suwen. Hey, it's Tom Marin at uh, Sinai. Uh, it's a super exciting trial. I feel like maybe we've talked about this before, but is there a backup plan for once you have cohorts closed to enrollment, if you screen patients, you know, similar to the, the match trial where there's kind of like a backup bin where you, all the patients have some sort of treatment options? Yeah, it's a great question. And one that I think we've struggled, struggled with in past calls and balancing out the fact that there's a pilot trial um, as of now, they will not be eligible and there's not a backup. Um, and unfortunately, it'd be a screen fail. Okay. Yeah, the, the patients will be given uh, the results of the, the screening tests. Um, so the uh, in the first part, um, in stage one, patient does not uh, do not need to wait for the results uh, before they are treated. And hopefully, um, you know, at interim analysis, We'll have some idea, you know, um, how likely uh, we will be able to um, to meet the, uh, you know, the turnaround time, meet, meeting the criteria, and also, you know, the distribution. We'll have some idea about the distribution of the patients. Um, so, you know, it's um, it, that will help us to um, to plan the second stage uh, to minimize the patient that has to be screened but cannot be assigned treatment. Oh, I, there's um, uh, a question. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, Kim um, uh, I'm, I'm just curious. This is a totally practical question, uh, which is given the histologies that are eligible for this trial, is there uh, supposed to be cross referencing of this trial in the two committees that would be involved? Um, I, I may have slept through it, but I haven't heard anything about the trial in melanoma committee uh, at the conference calls and at the um, C. Wynn is the is leading the melanoma clinical side. Head and neck, um, we were disbanded as a committee many years ago, so we're through the. No one likes us. That's, that's the, but um, so we're actually through rare cancers, and we've discussed this repeatedly. And there's there's heavy support from our entire group as well, and we have several other um, head and neck trials in development as well. So very excited about this. Good, C. Wynn, come on the call sometime and talk about the trial. Yeah, there are a lot of uh, discussion about uh, at the, the Melanoma Media as well, and the, the group chairs um, are very supportive. And we have uh, presented this uh, concept a few times in the past. Um, so after the protocol is activated, then we'll do more, um, you know, advertising of, about this trial. Um, absolutely. So um, if there's no further questions, um, I think we can uh, conclude the meeting. Um, I really appreciate um, everyone calling in, especially this late uh, in, from the East Coast. Um, so um, I want to um, welcome everybody um, to uh, consider joining our committee. Uh, if you are interested in uh, immunotherapy, regardless which, uh, which committee you're coming from. Um, so the goal for our committee is uh, to um, unite, um, you know, these um, IO efforts from different disease groups and hopefully uh, we can move um, IO initiatives, um, you know, across different disease groups uh, forward, just like the IMATCH trial, um, you know, at SWAG. So, um, we have a monthly meeting, as uh, Katie mentioned, um, and um, I uh, let us know you, if you want to join the meetings. You don't have to be a member to join the meetings, so you can uh, call in and see uh, what we're up to, what kind of agenda we have. Um, so um, let Katie and I know. Um, you know, if you're interested, we will forward to you um, the um, the link to call in. So uh, Katie, I will. Um, leave this, uh, I will um, let you uh, conclude the meeting um, and address to the audience over there. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, so thank you everybody for attending uh, this session. Thank you to the presenters, both the presenter, the presenter in person <laughs> and uh, our uh, virtual presenters. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at future 
immunotherapeutics committee meetings.